It's a celebration here in the studio because the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast is a winner. Thanks to the Cybersecurity Excellence Awards for awarding us a Best Cybersecurity Podcast gold medal in our category. Yeah. We're celebrating, but we're giving all of you the gift. We're once again giving away a free month of our InfoSec Skills platform, which features targeted learning modules, cloud-hosted cyber ranges, hands-on projects, certification practice exams, and skills assessments. To take advantage of this special offer for CyberWork listeners, head over to infosecinstitute.com skills, or click the link in the description below. Sign up for an individual subscription as you normally would, then in the coupon box, type the word CyberWork, C-Y-B-E-R-W-O-R-K, no spaces, no capital letters, and just like magic, you can claim your free month. Thank you once again for listening to and watching our podcast. We appreciate each and every one of you coming back each week. So enough of that, let's begin the episode. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Carl Sharman is vice president with Beecher Madden, a cybersecurity staffing and recruiting firm based out of London. Uh, We talk a lot about uh, cybersecurity tips, career tips here. Uh, You know, this is uh, called cyber work after all, Uh, but it's not every day that we get to talk to someone who actually helps put people into their dream positions. So we're going to talk about ways that security departments can find the right people for their positions how professionals can find places to work, and how hiring and career movement is happening in the age of shelter in place. Carl Sharman is a former head of recruitment in football, soccer, that assisted in selling one million pounds worth of talent for a variety of clubs. Since switching to cybersecurity recruitment in 2017, Carl is now the North American practice leader for prominent cybersecurity recruitment company, Beecher Madden. With 10 years of recruitment experience, he supports organizations... Uh, in their help to identify, acquire, and retain talent in the cybersecurity and risk management sector across North America. He consults the industry on career paths, salary benchmarking, talent pools, and recruitment and retaining strategies. Uh, Carl was featured in the top 1% of search and staffing professionals globally by LinkedIn, and Beecher Madden won Security Recruitment Company of the Year for 2019. Uh, Carl, thank you so much for joining us today on CyberWork. No, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Uh, so I want to talk about your background a little bit. That's a, uh, that's a great bio. So you, 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 you moved over to cybersecurity recruiting specifically around 2017. And before that you were involved with, uh, uh, football or, you know, soccer for us Yanks. Um, uh, you know, uh, when did you first get interested in computers and tech? Was this something that you were interested in, you know, when you were younger or did this come later in life or just with this particular job change? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I think, uh, when when growing up animals and and sport and you know they they were sort of my two my two things growing up um i i did i did uh, a lot of a lot of soccer um you know i am based in america so i have to say soccer now but um but uh yeah and and i did a lot of like you know uh horseback riding and stuff like that growing up as well so they were like my two obsessions and and you know, my uncle introduced me to a computer. He's a actual, he's a um, aircraft engineer, and he mm. was very technical in that respect. And introduced me to computers at a very young age, okay. um, and got me into that sort of you know gaming world and and a lot of different other areas. But it it wasn't really till I came out of university. Um, where I did where I did uh, football and business studies at university, and I and. I only knew like computing, like for the internet, you know, Microsoft Word, Excel as as a normal worker. But when I got into the, into the soccer industry, it was very data driven, database heavy, um, a lot of analysis from that respect. So I had to learn a lot of technology that I hadn't, but because of my, because I've been, um, I suppose exposed to that, it allowed me to accelerate my career and allowed me to go up the ladder a lot quicker because when I entered the soccer industry, they were looking for people that had that type of skill set who were quick mm. learners, adaptable with technology, because so much technology was entering the market. This was in sort of 2013. 
2013, 2014, and we had, you know, all these statistical um, data driven, like I said, um, technology is entering the market. And a lot of the, you know, no disrespect, but a lot of the older guard who used a notepad to do scouting sure. um, suddenly had to adapt their methods, but were a lot yeah. slower and stuff like that. And it allowed me to accelerate. So that was my real exposure into technology. When you ask about cybersecurity, that's very different. Um, I think you're aware of um, like generic terms being a generic person, you know, like hacking or yeah. uh, phishing, you know, them types of things. And you're very aware of, I suppose, the word fraud or scam is a lot more common than that for, for a normal person. And I think once you start to even read a little bit of the content, you suddenly start getting a little bit obsessed. It's like them, uh, it's like them murder, them murder stories that you get on yeah. Netflix and you watch one and then you, you want to watch more. And, yeah. it, and it became like that with cybersecurity, it become like another, I won't go as far as an obsession, but there's some great people out there that put some great content out there. Um, you know, whether it's podcasts, written content, uh, a variety of different methods right. and I just started reading about it and then in 2017 I um, I had a lot of some failures some some deliberate choices I suppose mm -hmm. in the in the soccer industry and I opted to um, team up with a with a soccer agent who had started his own recruitment company mm. and he started in technology and they were making a lot of their money through developers and you know, placing developers, building uh, architecture teams for, for companies, doing a lot of transformation work. And one area that he hadn't touched was cybersecurity. So I saw, I approached him and, and, and him and his other co-founders interviewed me to head up that space for them. And that's how it really started. And I sort of used my recruitment and talent acquisition skills uh, and just had been learning and reading about cybersecurity. And it was a huge learning curve talking to people like CISOs, you know, CIOs, <laughs> about what they do <laughs> yeah yeah. What do you do? yeah, you, yeah i'm learning on the fly as well here right with you yeah well i mean firstly what what you do is a great way of learning yeah. um because all i did was ask a lot of questions and listened and and that was that was really exactly my acceleration <laughs> yeah uh, but it works it works yeah, and, it and that's my recommendation to anyone who wants to get into the industry and learn is just ask 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 like yeah. ask as many questions people want to give you that time especially in the u.s you know the the uk culture is slightly different and that's okay. where i've come from um you know you will find people that want to learn but not everyone wants to give you that helping hand um yeah. and that's just the that's just the british culture unfortunately yeah. um but in the u.s i found that once i entered this market in early 2018 it was a just you know just over two two and a half years ago now um it was it was totally different everyone wanted to have that conversation and i have a number of mentors who are cso's in the us now who if i need to understand about certain aspects of you know a nist framework or certain aspects about this technology to help me better answer questions for my clients i'm now able to do that because of the help i had and and that was really what accelerated my knowledge in the market was just asking questions Hmm. Okay, so um, I, I guess we're, we're here to t today to talk about, you know, hiring strategies in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, so I'd like to start with a topic that's been very curious to us here at InfoSec. Uh, we've had some mixed messages regarding uh, hiring practices in cybersecurity. Are you finding that organizations are emphasizing the need for traditional educational credentials like a BA or a BS when searching for candidates? I feel like this question's come up a lot lately, like okay. uh, a, a lot from organizations, a lot in, a lot in interviews. Uh, a lot of people have contacted me ab about this. What are, what are we seeing? Yeah. And I must say, and I don't have the official stats on it, but I, but I imagine looking for our job descriptions since the start of the year, 95% will still include a bachelor's degree. Yep. Um, and, and there's a real issue in that because as you know, and, uh, and as many people know that will be listening and watching this, not everyone has a degree. You know, yep. I, I, I think there's, I, you know, the, firstly, there's a great group out there called um, Aspen, Aspen uh, Cybersecurity, who are trying mm -hmm. to change the initiative with this like we are. You know, okay. we spend a lot of time, probably 60 to 70 percent of my time is spent educating clients on what they should look look for, how job descriptions should be. And right. poor job descriptions are leading to this myth of a skills gap. Um, yes. And, and we, I'm sure we're going to come on to that as well oh, yeah. in, a, in a little while. But um, but yeah, going back to your point about bachelor's degree so many companies ask for this, especially large organizations. And normally it comes down to company policy. 
Yeah. So normally it's done because the finance team has to have this or the, um, the sales team has to has, have this. But in cybersecurity, we're creating our own skills gap, which is only created by ourselves, yes. that is being generated by people making poor job descriptions. And I think that's, you know, that's what allows it to be exciting for us and where mm. it creates an opportunity for us because it creates that education path for organizations. And I know it's hard because the security team aren't in control of all these processes aren't in control if there needs to be a bachelor's degree but there are some companies that will get better talent by just opening this market up and i think like i think with that i think we need to get over this bias i think we have this old school bias that university degrees equal being intelligent and I, and I think that's totally wrong. And I think a lot of people rely on that. A lot of organizations rely on that as a safety buffer and to say, if this person fails, oh, he, he, he had all the credentials, had all the certifications. He must yeah. have just been the wrong fit. And I think that's a total wrong way of looking at it. I think we need to take more risks. I think we need to take uh, more chances on people. And my push to my clients is very much, why don't we measure on culture fit? You know, why don't we why don't we look at them avenues and start to look down them routes rather than focus so much on certifications and degrees? Because certification degrees, all they do is they they they're a tick box exercise in certain cases. And yep. you know, I'm one to talk. I'm currently on my master's degree, so you know, I'm not the I'm not exactly living by my own standards yeah, you're, here. You're not, you're not anti you know education anyway. It's just, uh, <laughs> no, it, not at yeah, all. But it, but it's a it's a specific sort of barrier to entry that might not be necessary there. Exactly right. And I've had very, very excellent candidates that are rejected in the process because they yeah. don't have a degree. And there's even, there's even companies that will reject them if they don't finish the degrees or mm -hmm. the certifications before they, before they can accept the job. I mean, it's just, right. it, it's insane to me. It's yeah. a barrier that we're putting in place that we don't need to. And, and like I said, I think it's very much a bias. I think it's very much to protect people and cybersecurity, you know, and this is sometimes the problem with HR general generalists in, in certain cases is they base cybersecurity on every other market in that organization as we know right. cybersecurity is very complex it's a very different market you know sometimes you need to break down them barriers of the exactly same salaries for audit as it is for cybersecurity or the exact same salaries for you know the finance team as it is for cybersecurity but we also need to do the same with job descriptions mm -hmm. and, and and degrees is a huge part of that and like i said there's there's a number of groups that are trying to improve this but me personally i'd rather go to an organization that wasn't making that and putting barriers in my place because if that's the type of red tape that they're putting in place that could be the red tape that they're that could be a sign of the red tape they could put in in other places yeah. when trying to maneuver right so yeah i asked that question specifically because there's there's a very interesting sort of friction going around right now like i talked to a lot of you know, CISOs, CEOs, even CEOs of their own companies and so forth will say, you know, as long as you have the ability to prove, you know, your work, lack of degree doesn't matter. But, you know, we're still hearing these stories, like you said, where, you know, people without degrees aren't even getting sort of in the door. So I, there's, there seems to be this sort of disconnect between HR or the hiring manager, you yes. know, tailoring these job descriptions, looking for these unicorn candidates. Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, on the other side of the barrier, there's the people who would actually work with this person saying, I don't need any of that stuff, you know? So, uh, you know, so, so it's, it's not even just that we're sort of like trying to turn the hearts and minds of these companies. It's, it's that we're trying to get them to sort of even sort of connect together within their own company between the sort of what IT security departments need and what HR is trying to give them. So, you know, what, what do we do? What do we do about this, this friction? That's the hardest part. You know, yeah. if you go into any organization, they are, uh, there are a number of rifts, friction, as you say. Um, that's a good way of describing it. Um, and, and I think often it is between HR and the hiring managers, you know, and sometimes we get involved in that because we get stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're here trying to place a candidate and that's all, that's all our aim is. Our aim is to solve the CISO's pain. That's the way we look at it. So, you know, we are we are 100% focused on that. And sometimes HR or other leaders get involved and block that because they have their own agenda. And that's, mm -hmm. that's you know, 
for for anything that we're looking to do the number one skill that we need is influence and the number one skill that a CISO needs currently is influence how how much influence can you get over your board over your c-suite over your hr and we're we're in exactly the same position we're trying to influence as many people to convince them that our candidate is the one that needs they need for this position I imagine this is sort of thing that, you know, eventually people will get the point, but by then it'll be too late. So like, is there, are there things that we can sort of be doing in the meantime to sort of, yeah. as you say, be swaying the, the C-suite and be, you know, swaying HR and stuff? For me, it's data. It's being evidence, yeah. you know, data led. And, and what I mean is, is not just chucking data for the sake of chucking data. It's, it's actually uh, quality, high quality data. And, and, and for me, that's, that's evidence. That's the evidence. If there's, if there's, if if it's taking too long to fill a position, and what I mean like that is anything over anything over, I suppose eight to twelve weeks yeah. is way too long to fill. Now I get it. Companies might have real long processes, and we can come onto that. I'm yeah, sure about course. about yeah. company That's processes. A whole other, whole other candidate, yeah. yeah. And, and we might lose candidates through that process. I, I totally understand right. that, and that's why companies sometimes partner with us to try and manage them candidates through the process. However, there are certain things we can do, and one of them is uh, what we say to our clients: is what's the three things you cannot live without on this job description? Eliminate the rest. What's the three things you can't live without? Yeah. Because you start to make hiring managers and HR directors or whoever it is in the talent acquisition process really consider what's a priority. And prioritizing is probably what the humans are worst at by far because yeah. we just want to find this perfect person. You want and, everything. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and there isn't that perfect person out there. And we rule out a very, very good candidates because they haven't got – a to Z while really we just need a B and C that's all we need that's all we need to and the rest of it is culture fit the other yeah. and that should be 30% should be the free things 70% should be culture fit because if you've got someone who wants to learn who's ambitious who's driven who's going to do their absolute all for the loyalty of the person or the brand depending on where their loyalty sits and often it's the person often it's will be the CISO or the, their hiring manager that goes a lot further than having certifications, a degree, a hundred things that needs to be happening. And what we find our data has always told us when we're looking at diversity recruitment, which is something that we, we spend a lot of time on. Mm -hmm. A lot of candidates don't apply for that job because the job description is too long. And we yeah. find that neurodiverse and often women mm -hmm. rule themselves out when they get two two yeah. things that they haven't got two or more things that they haven't got on that job description. Yeah. They rule themselves out. So yeah. you could be ruling out 30 to 40% of your talent pool solely through making job descriptions too complex, too difficult to, to adhere to, or too, even too long, which can be quite boring for people. Um, and we, if you look at our, if you look at our website or the way we do job descriptions, we, we have three things that you, that you need to like, uh, that you will be doing on your day job and three things that you need to have to be qualified for that position. And that's how we qualify people. And that's what we try to tell our clients. And unfortunately, like you said, there's a friction there because often it's company policy. So I think the CISO needs to be a little bit more open when applicants are coming through and yeah. actually bypass HR and go, right, these are the three things I'm looking for. Right. And actually when, when candidates get, are getting sifted through from talent acquisition or recruiter or HR, actually go, do they meet them free things? And if they do, that qualifies them for an interview. And then we can start them putting in the processes in place in order to actually make this a more successful hire for that hiring manager. And, you know, that, that is the key steps that we are now taking with our clients to mitigate this friction with HR, talent acquisition, or, or like I said, the company policy, because it's culture, you know, it's free, it's free influences there. You've got culture, you've got the leadership, and then you've got the actual opinions of people, which is the hardest thing to please, because that can yeah. change on a daily basis. Yeah. And yeah, that's, I mean, that lines up, we, we've had a number of uh, women in the industry on the, on the show in the past and, you know, we, we got a very consistent, you know, answer and, and, you know, and statistics and people, you know, agreeing with us that, you know, a lot of women or, you know, people of color, or you said neurodiverse people will, will avoid, uh, you know, if they, if they're not hundred percent qualified, they say, oh, I'm not going to do it. Whereas a lot of other folks will, if they're even 40% qualified, they're like, Oh, close enough, you know, but um, I, I really like this yeah. idea of like, cutting it down to three things you need because I think 
it, it seems to me that a lot of the sort of issues we're having here is this sort of templatization of, you know, job descriptions. And, and also that, you know, like you said, that, that, that notion of like, it's like packing for a vacation, like you got to pack everything. It's like, all right, we're getting it all into this one little bag, you know, we're only going to be out of town for two days, you know, so figure it out. But, um, you know, is, I think, is, is there a benefit, I think, to maybe just scrapping the sort of HR job template in the case of security and, and sort of custom writing these, you know, on a case by case basis? Does that you think that'll sort of clear the clutter, maybe? Well, I mean, I, I don't understand how we don't do that. Like it, it yeah. should be, it should be per position, not as sure. a standard. Sure. Um, you know, I say that to candidates, candidates should provide a resume that fits that job. And oh, that yeah. means they've taken the time to, to do it. And, and, organizations should take care this is their external marketing this is how candidates perceive them in the market and we are in a candidate-led market in cybersecurity. so we you know we are all trying to find the a players in the market that's what all organizations want they want the best that is out there for the price they're willing to pay and you know if you're going to market you know, the wrong job description or generic or just generic terms, you're not going to appeal to the market that you probably want, which is the market that everyone is going after. And if you want the best, you need to market it better. And there's certain organizations that do it very well. And there's certain organizations, especially large companies that that don't because they just get generic HR people to often write their job descriptions. Mm -hmm. And the the risk and security teams are often very busy people as they have a day job to to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And they will have a look at it and go, does it do what I basically need? Yes, let's sign off on it. And that's commonly what we see as as that, as that, um, you know, issue. And And I totally get that because CISOs are very, very, sorry, very overworked in terms of their jobs. Mm-hmm. Many security yep. folks will say that they are. Um, and they don't have the time to do recruiting. They don't have the time to do job descriptions. They, they have HR partners for that reason. Um, and and that, that then means you go out to a non-specialist and you go out there and they either try and search for people and often search wrong and waste time or they come up with these generic job descriptions that doesn't, don't market the company appropriately. Mm-hmm. And marketing the storytelling is the two biggest skills, I think, that companies need to realize when they are when they are doing cybersecurity. And like I said, some companies are doing exceptional. Some companies have podcasts, you know, uh, marketing tools, Mm -hmm. they're holding events to try and lure candidates in. They've got really good internship programs. You know, they are trying to do as much as they can to build a talent pool or to increase their talent depth for when someone leaves they now have a number of names that they can go to that they already know um and that that is impressive and that's talent strategy that is talent marketing that is where it needs to go and if you're going to get ahead of the curve or the the cyber the um the talent on on war as we call it uh here but you have to get ahead of the curve and it means being creative and it means being a marketeer and it means being a storyteller. And that's where, you know, leaders in cybersecurity need to convince their HR and talent acquisition to transition to in order to get ahead of the curve and actually decrease the time, which is what we all want. We want that pain to go away. Yeah. We need to decrease that fill time. And that's, that's where we're focused on. And that's what we're focused on doing. Yeah, I'm you know for as long as I can remember going back to college, like when they would say when writing a a resume, you know, you said customize it to the job, but also like, you know, in the you know in the cover letter and in the resume, you need to tell the story of why you would be perfect for them and you know build the bridge to the employer. But we don't see a lot of that in the other direction where you know they're building the bridge to the person that they want. And I think what you're saying here makes a lot of sense in terms of like it needs you know we both need to be on either side need to be building the bridge to each other. Like I, you need to see why you could work here and why, you know, you're not having to swim across a moat, you know, filled with alligators and, you know, uh, you know, to, to even get to our front door. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I say to every candidate that interviews for us, you know, when I'm preparing them for their interview, uh, I always say, look, you utilize this as a two way interview. It has to be like that. You know, we're no longer in that bureaucratic society where it's a one way interview. It has to be two ways. Mm -hmm. And organizations need to be aware of that, that that they are interviewing and the person is interviewing them because often we know that candidates will have five, six processes if they're, if they're actively looking. And even if they're not actively looking, 
they will guarantee to have other options. They will at least have two or three other options. So you can sort of guarantee that in, in the recruitment market that you know you are fighting for that talent. So you need to be able to put the right solution in place. And that, that is from that job description. That job description is the first thing that company that people often see going into the process. So if you're talking about a talent identification and talent, talent acquisition process, the first point of call is often that the second point of call is often a talent acquisition person or a recruiter. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you have to screen them. You have to make sure that they are saying the right things. They are marketing the organization in the appropriate ways and able to answer the questions that the candidate might give them. Then it's all about the process from there, how they get into the process, who's interviewing, how well are they interviewing? Is that aligned with everyone else? in the process are we all saying the same sort of vocabulary and it's it's them little details that give you their marginal gains an extra one percent that we're incredibly focused on here yeah. that allows us and allows organizations to win and that's all we care about is our, our clients winning that's all yeah. we care about sure. and it's them little one percent through that process and as you said it starts with that detailed but very concise and very specific job description there you go. Uh, so do you want, uh, want to talk at all about the sort of, we, we talk about the, the skills half-life, you know, where, where there's, there's so much where even if you're not, you know, doing an educational thing, you know, but you're just, just learning the industry, you know, so much information is, you know, worthless after six months or outdated or whatever. <laughs> do you feel that the speed of technological development is preventing potential cybersecurity pros from keeping up with these new innovations? It depends on the individual. I, I honestly think that we are very fortunate in cybersecurity. People are aware of that. Mm -hmm. I, I think if you're not, you're in the wrong industry. Right. Um, and I think if you don't want to learn, innovate, change, you are in the wrong industry. You can't stand still in cybersecurity. Like yeah. there is, you know, we can't, we can't stand still. If we stand, if we stand still for a month or two, we no longer exist. Mm -hmm. uh, in doing what we do because our competitors take us over or we don't keep up with the latest trend. You know, there are certain growth areas such as instant response, application security, um, uh, cloud security and, and mm -hmm. product security that are, you know, them four areas are high growth. There's a lot of different areas going into them, you know, without going into the technology side of, you know, containers or the cloud providers, right. you know, like you can start going in and going very complex with that. And it is all about keeping ahead of the trend to make sure that you have a job in five to 10 years time. And that's where yeah. you've got to keep asking what's your why and where do you see yourself in five to 10 years time? Where do you see the market? And that's why I'm always saying, ask, 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 ask us what we're seeing in trends. Where do we see them going? Ask the CISO, what are they seeing? Like you have to keep asking questions to make sure that you are maintaining with the trend, with the curve. Yes. Okay. You want to keep ahead of the curve, but that is incredibly difficult to do unless you're in the know-how and got that exposure. Right. If you want to stay with the curve and make sure that you keep current and don't fall out of the employment circle, which can happen to many industries as it has done previously, um, you've got to keep keep learning and keep educating. And what's been great the last two, three years is seeing, you know, many of the providers like, you know, the InfoSec Institute, uh, you know, and some of the other companies that are in the space actually providing education tools, the chance to actually use some of these technologies mm -hmm. whether it's uh, on the forensic side or the real yep. like tool side of you know the seam tools etc but actually getting that hands-on experience as well as not just you know that that just you know listening to a listening to a speaker or what it could be and i think that's where organizations are now looking who's actually got hands-on experience that can actually bring that in and actually provide you know uh, utilize that in-house and and them learning tools are allowing people to keep advanced and keep ahead of that to actually empower and enable some of the organization's problems uh so turn let's turn this around a little bit to the other side of the equation in terms of uh, people looking for jobs. So, you know, we've, mm. hopefully we've removed some of the barriers to entry here. We've, you know, eliminated the, uh, the educational requirements and, you know, we've, we've sort of pared it down to the things, you know, that the company really wants. So if you are someone who's just kind of getting started in the industry and want to, and maybe you don't have a lot of hands-on experience or what are, what are some of the things uh, that you can do with your resume and your cover letter that will sort of make you stand out and come to the attention of the companies that you want to work for? 
I think it's a really good question. And, uh, and, and I, I've been asked that a lot by candidates, obviously, with mm-hmm. the current climate. Um, and it's, it sort of makes you think because it's, it's not just what we look at. We're trying to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the, of the hiring manager um, and, and what they're looking for. And, and that, that's very different because it's the individual. Uh, and that's where it's slightly complex. But the, the generic things that we say um, is very much around keep it short, try and keep it mm-hmm. to two pages or less yeah. no one really cares about what you did 10 years ago even five years ago everyone's now yeah. about now on the present as yeah. you just said cyber security is ever changing you mm-hmm. you won't have been doing the same technology uh you right. know uh, we won't be maybe using the same technology 10 years ago as you are now like it's yeah. adapted it's changed yeah. so people care about the, pre- the the near and the present that's the first thing so keep you know your previous jobs very small you know, you can keep the jobs in there. I think that's really important. So they don't think you've got gaps in there. Or just highlight the one thing that you did 10 years ago that still relates to what you do now or whatever. Yeah. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And then achievements, numbers, and tools. So, um, Mm -hmm. any, um, you know, as we said, data is, data is king these days. It provides evidence. So if you can show a, uh, a 50% reduction in threats because of something you did, that's, that's great. Yeah, I can and keep go and, those numbers on the job too. Like while you're doing the job, you know, make sure yeah. if your if your boss says, you know, we've we've brought the number down, make a note somewhere, man. Keep absolutely, it. yeah, absolutely, and, and they are. You know, people can see that, people can feel that, you know, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm talking about, about being a marketeer, being a storyteller. Like yep. you have to be able to tell your own story. No one cares that you turned up to and worked 40 hours a week. People care about your actual, you know, achievement, your actual experience within that position. Yeah. And that's what's crucial. That's what, that's what people will look at. Okay. They've been a, you know, a, uh, the, you know, biggest retailer in the world, but what did they actually do? What did they actually achieve? Were they actually hands on? Were they right. actually dealing with this tool? You know, were they using this seam tool or, you know, were they part of the sock or whatever it can be for that position? Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's really cr- crucial. But the, the, but the third part is the most critical, right? If I look at, if I look at jobs on LinkedIn and we can all do this, we can all go on LinkedIn, put in our favorite job, put in CISO, See how many applicants it's had. I guarantee it's had 300, 400 applicants, maybe more. Then they've probably got, they've probably either got a, uh, they've got an internal team on that. They've got internal referrals. They've got external referrals. Then they've got recruiters working on it. So you're talking about five, six avenues. That's without going to job boards. That's without going to, you know, like random uh, conversations or people that they've had previously you know there's so many different ways of getting to people which is the way all the ways we use by the way as well so if we're a recruiter you know you're talking about 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 different avenues by the time you start getting into recruiters for that organization to source from and you expect your resume to get to them get to the hiring manager on the desk and actually be seen and looked at yeah the chance of that is Okay, it's not it's not the same as what Richard Dawkins says about us being born, but right. it's 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 a it's a real it's a real yeah. hard chance, and yeah, right. and, and, and I think that's it's overwhelming to some people. Absolutely, like I, I'm sure you've got like if you go and look at a new job and you see 400 people have already gone for it on LinkedIn, I'm like, well, I'm not going to apply for that. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, I'm not the one. You know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like if, if my profile doesn't line up exactly, I'm not going to stand out. So what do I do? Well, Mm -hmm. I I, I apply and then I follow up and I keep following up till at least someone answers my call or someone answers my email and I keep doing it. I keep trying to get referred in. I use a recruiter and I call the recruiter till they, till they're fed up with me. I never ever. And by the way, other recruiters might be different, but I never ever get fed up by a candidate that, that keeps ringing my phone about an opportunity. Yeah. Like I, I want to understand, not that they're hungry or, or passionate, but I need to understand about their profile. I need to be able to tell their story. I can't tell yeah. it off a resume. Yeah. There's only certain amount of information that, that a resume um, can hold. You know, we, we, if I see a 12 page, 15 page resume, I'm already bored by the first page oh, and that's yeah. no disrespect to the person, but I just, we, we get through so many resumes, so many applications. I don't have time, but if someone's got, you know, a two minute pitch to me about their candidacy for a position, mm-hmm. I can either tell them that they're right for the role or they're wrong for the role, but at least I get an idea if they are right for the role from my perspective and then I can present them to my client. And that is the key. Like it's all in the follow up, and people forget this. People get so held up. You know, I don't even read cover letters anymore because, Mm. 
it doesn't tell me enough. It just tell often cover letters tell me exactly what just told me in the job description yep. and the job, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the resume, sorry. Mm-hmm. And the resume tells me exactly what's on their LinkedIn quite often. Mm-hmm. So I could have just searched for them on LinkedIn and found that like, what are you telling me differently? Okay. You now make me stand out and make me go sit up and go, okay, they're the ones I need to call back. Yeah. They're the ones I need to get in for an interview, you know, and that's the difference. It's okay. all in the follow-up and, 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 that, and the resume is just not enough anymore. Yeah. Now, uh, that, that sort of brought up a, a, another thought that I just had, but like, let, you know, I think we've all had it before. We've applied to what we thought was a job we would have been a hundred percent perfect for. Like it absolutely lines yeah. up with our experience and don't even get a call. Like what, what are some, you know, I, I, without being a nuisance or whatever, but like, what do you, what are your, some suggestions for sort of like making your case, even when you think you're perfect and you're not, and they don't think you're perfect or they didn't see you or they got bored after five resumes or whatever, do, you know, do you have any other tips in that yeah. regard? Yeah, it is. Again, it's incredibly complex because you don't yeah. know who else is involved in the process. So mm-hmm. that, that's the key thing. Um, I think, always have more discussions so talk Mm -hmm. to more people in the company than you need to if you're going direct if you're going through the recruiter ask them what makes you what will make you stand out as a candidate for this position what was the hiring manager or the hr director said to them about what the key parts of this Mm -hmm. position Mm -hmm. um ask them more questions and that's where ask 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 comes back to it comes comes into it because it's it's such an important uh, way you know if you're trying to go direct get referred in get referred in by someone else in the team. Do you know someone? Security is a small market. You know, I, mm-hmm. I know, you know, like on our database, we probably have anywhere between six to 10,000 people, which sounds a lot, but it's not once you really, you know, know the moving yeah. parts, like right. you will probably the across the country. Yeah, exactly. I will probably know at least one or two people in majority of the security operations across, across the United States. Mm-hmm. That's not because I'm good at my job. It's just because I get referred into different people. I, I, I go and ask people and I go, Oh, can you refer me into here or can you push into here? And over two and a half years, I've been able to grow my network. And that that's the key for people, especially like younger people is network, network, network. Mm-hmm. Like you, you have to keep doing it. You, and, it and it's tiring. It is tiring. Yeah. We don't all have the time to sit on LinkedIn and do it. That's part of my job. I have to sit on LinkedIn. It's where a lot of my job happens. Yep. It's where a lot of my conversations happen as well as the phone. Mm-hmm. And that's my job. So I get to network as my job for 24, you know, we're filled. 24 7 anyway but uh but it's it's a huge part of the job and that that that's crucial but it's the same for people that are looking for their next opportunity or even not looking to keep networking because it's a way of learning it's a way of you know having a better network but if things do go wrong or you need to change they are the first person you go to like the recruiters to go and get your next position um and i think like the power is in the question the power is in the network and the power is in the follow-up and they're the three things that i can say is how you qualify if this is right for you because even if it looks good on paper what the opinion of the hiring manager might be slightly different to what's wrote on the paper because people's opinion change and it can be a timing thing you know like we we have that with a couple of clients where they've gone we've been searching for three weeks and they've gone actually the CISO's changed his mind yeah. We're actually going to pull this post back in right. and we're going to revisit it in the next mm-hmm. week. We're going to have a lot of discussions about what he's actually looking for because 10 candidates have been rejected that are perfect on the job description, but are not meeting his needs. So mm-hmm. then we need to understand that. And we always push back on our clients going, this isn't working. We can't keep working like this. This isn't helping your reputation in the market because you're mucking around candidates. But secondly, these candidates are going to be candidates that you're going to want in two to five years time. If they have a bad experience now, they're not going to want to come back and work for this manager or this company again. And and that's the, that's the pressure and the risk that you have when you market or or get that opportunity wrong. And that's the hard thing for candidates is, is trying to match the individual's opinions or expectations. Uh, so obviously the past few months have probably completely changed the employment landscape yet again with, uh, you know, unemployment being what it is and, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people's jobs being furloughed and, and people looking for new new work. It, can you talk a little bit about what the jo- job market is right now in the age of COVID-19? Are there companies looking for candidates? And, and if so, like where, who's hiring? Uh, have, you know, the processes changed for being noticed or getting an interview? Or is it all just since it's all online anyways, is it pretty much the same? 
It's, it's an excellent question. It's, yeah. it's so, firstly, it's such a strange uh, time to be a part of, right? Like yeah. there's, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things trying, you trying to understand it. Yeah, right. We work globally. So, you know, I'm very fortunate. That I only focus on North America, but our company focuses globally. So we see different things in different areas. Sure. So if we're just talking about uh, North America, and, and um, our main focus is U.S. and Canada with, with, our, with that. Um, so if we look at them two markets, it's slow. Every process is slow. Every candidate will tell you slow. Every hiring manager will tell you it's frustrating mm-hmm. right now to, to, to do what they want to do. And there's been a lot of cutback. You know, yep. we're, we're seeing a lot, of can, a lot of clients and a lot of companies uh, that we deal with pull back, pull back and just go, Let's wait. The market's a little bit unsteady. Let's mm-hmm. see what, you know, the, the president does. Let's see what the markets do and let's make yep. this plan from there. And that's, you know, as a, someone who understands business and runs the strategy here, I totally understand that. We, yeah. We've done exactly the same from a hiring process, you know, for, uh, internally, like we've, we've put things on hold and focused. However, the risk doesn't go away. And as what we've seen, the yep. risk has accelerated from cyber threats or fraud attempts yes. uh, and, and, you know, a lot of other threats, industry specific and state specific from that. So when you're looking at, what has accelerated what we're seeing is a lot of fortune 500 companies that are big targets have kept up hiring or haven't let anyone go they're the two they're the two strategies mm. that we're often seeing because they're high targets if you want yeah. a major bank you go after you go after the top 10 banks yeah. you know you want you want your big payday you want your you know you want the exposure if you're a state entity right. or you're a you know you're a, you're a group that's trying to get attention mm-hmm. so they're, they're still at risk and they're regulated from from a, a breach response uh, standpoint and they're also you know they've also got a lot of shareholders to police you know yeah. they don't want to lose that money so they have to make sure that that risk and that pr um you know crisis doesn't doesn't occur for them the other areas are uh, cash rich companies like amazon etc mm-hmm. that are doing very well at the pandemic that are seeing um new areas that are you know coming out new threats or new ways of working where they're having to adapt their security staff and risk staff mm-hmm. and uh, having to meet that need and then the the other the other area which has been great is um you know been really exciting to see is critical infrastructure and governments because they're right. having to keep they're having to keep running like they, they can't stop running and they can't let the guard down for any what reason so the government entities i live in virginia uh right near right near a lot of the government entities mm-hmm. and we are seeing constant hiring constant growth yep. you know a lot of new roles being opened up and that's exactly the same in the critical infrastructure space and don't get me wrong there's there's exceptions there are exceptions in healthcare pharmaceuticals obviously are doing very well right now at this crisis but they're the sort of three that that we see quite often is your fortune 500 your cash rich companies mm-hmm. and like i said your your real critical infrastructure entities that are seeing more exposure of risk and having to deal with it. And, and they're the ones that are really hiring right now and really accelerating in funding from that respect. And unfortunately, if we flip the coin, you're seeing retail furlough and get rid of entire security yeah. teams. You're seeing hospitality is exactly the same. Oh, Obviously yeah. uh, your whole tourism market, you know, like the airlines and stuff like that has been hit. Yeah. Oil and gas companies massively hit. So you've got the reverse and that's where we're seeing a lot of, good talent opening up yep. for the other companies to take advantage of. And that's the message to our clients right now is take advantage of this time. While there's a lot of candidates, not necessarily at cheaper rates, but you're going to get them a lot easier and a lot quicker than you could have done previously. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit about salary then. It's, it's uh, this common conception that cybersecurity is this high paying profession. And I mean, obviously it can be at the you know CISO level, but uh, what are salaries like for people entering the profession and, and, and what can you expect uh, to move towards as you reach higher titles in the industry? And obviously, like you said, it's a, it's a little maybe depressed at the moment, but uh, you know, just, just so we can be realistic with people. Yeah, and we're trying to analyze that. Like I said, we're incredibly data driven. So we provide t- we one of our services is salary benchmarking for our clients. So okay. you know we constantly reach out to to other companies and say, look, th- this is what we're currently seeing. And 
we, we don't really know what the fallout is from a salary basis. You know, we are mm. hearing of companies potentially going to fire people, then rehire them on a lower salary, mm. um, you know, which is obviously a fear of the market right now. Um, and I, I, I would suggest in cyber that you don't need to do that. I think you can wait for that right opportunity, but your circumstance might not allow that. You might have to go back to work and earn money for your family. So that that's a risk. And I think them organizations will be found out from a branding perspective. Uh, I think Mark Cuban has summed it up previously earlier in the, in the, uh, in the, the, the pandemic saying that brands is a make and break time for these brands that are not going to look after their people. And I think cyber is the cyber teams are going to find that as well. You know, don't look after your people and, and they won't, they won't stay or they won't come back and, right. and that's what it's going to be. And they're going to tell their friends and that's going to work out to the bigger market. So that's, that's the first thing on, on, on salaries is uh, I don't think people should go back to their previous jobs unless uh, obviously, you know, circumstances say otherwise, but in terms of salary bandings, what we see for 2020 and going into 2021 as well, uh, if people are starting to financially plan for that, um, sort of your entry roles are anywhere between your, your 50 to 50 to 90,000, depending on the skill set and depending on, on where they sit. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is um, how big the organization is, right. um, your exposure, um, and whether you've got any sort of previous experience as well. Um, once you start going a sort of two to five years of experience, you start looking between the 90 to 130 banding, um, what we class as sort of an analyst, a consultant, or associate banding. That's how we class it. Um, and Years of experience is so opinionated again because you can come from an IT background of 10 to 15 years. There's not one path. And I love talking about career paths all day in cyber because yeah. I love it. It's fascinating. Like it is fascinating. When, yeah. when you get into sport, you go into an academy, you go straight the way up, you go into the first team. Yep. That's it. Like th there is normally one route in unless you get some exceptions. Yeah. But them exceptions are anomalies. In, in cyber, when you, when you, when we've done a lot of uh, a lot of uh, pointing, like we we go, okay, there's a dot there, there's a dot there, there's a dot there, there's a dot there. There's no, there's yes. not one path. Like right. there's so many ways in. So when we say years of experience, it's years in the workplace, okay, uh, and years of experience of not necessarily you know, like five years being a threat responder, but five years in being something of security. Yeah, exactly right, exactly right. Because that 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 is just as important. That is just as important because you can, you can navigate that and you can tell a story about how that yep. relates to that job and how that relates. Right. And that's where storytelling comes in. Um, a manager, a manager is, uh, is uh, often we see that banding around people who normally got four to eight years of experience and normally sitting in a manager sort of position. A manager can be a sort of SME type or a manager of a team. Uh, so it could be like a SOC manager, it could be an IR manager, whatever it could be. Uh, and often that, that job title is anywhere between 120 to 200. And the reason because of that gap, and that's quite a large gap, and you know we're going to talk about the CISO position in a minute where the gap becomes huge. Yeah. Um, but the, the reason because of that is because every organization values it differently. Some yes. some cyber managers would be a cyber director in a larger firm. There you go. Like it's mm -hmm. just that they could be a deputy CISO in that respect. So they could have more responsibility than a, than a manager who's just overseeing a small team of threat intelligence people. So it depends on the the responsibility, depends on the size of organization, and it depends on the location. And the last thing it depends on is whether you're regulated or not. And we, I can touch base on a little bit of that um, in terms of how that's now working out in the industries. Mm, okay. the, the next one is director. So what we call director, it can be um, obviously director can be broken into sort of your vice, your VPs, your SVPs, your SMDs, mm -hmm. you know, your different titles that the banks love and the insurance companies love to throw in now. And it seems like healthcare and pharmaceuticals are now following suit with that. Yep. Yep. Um, but you're sort of looking to seven to seven to 12 years, maybe a little bit more depending on the appetite of the person and whether the pathway to the next step up is there. And that's anywhere between 150 to 250. We're often seeing. Okay. So again, a bigger gap. And as you go up the pyramid, it gets a bigger gap, but then jobs become less and less. Of course. You know, they, they start filtering out once you get, obviously, as you know, to the CISO position where there isn't yeah. that many positions and you're fighting out with hundreds of other people for them. And position. you might only be in certain parts to, of the country too. Like you say, there might not be a ton of CISO absolutely. positions, you know, in some place that doesn't have a huge tech center. Yeah, absolutely. And we do that a lot for our clients. We will go um, and we can talk about talent strategies and how we find them for clients if you like. But like we, we start off 
local for our clients and then we start mapping it out because yeah. you know like we know that there's not always the best talent in a certain aspect of Kentucky you might have mm -hmm. to have someone who's remote or might have to pay a lot more to relocate them yep. because of that talent's not there uh, and I'm not picking on Kentucky as such no, that's course. just an example yeah. but um, but when you start getting into their more rural areas or like you say less tech hubs you start start having to fight with other companies that are all fighting for the same talent mm -hmm. and what a certain organization there's a there's a big financial services firm here in virginia uh who just started to try and pay premiums on people to get them away from other companies that has a very short term effect. We know money only drives people for a certain amount of time. That's human psychology. Yep. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you believe that, you know, yeah. suggest that. Yeah, um, but, um, but once you start, once you start thinking about, okay, what's the wider picture of this? Okay. Here's your salary band, but this is the other benefits. We're going to provide you with an education. We're going to provide you with access to this access to that. Here's your four one K for, you know, to, to, you know, to, you know, provide your future. Here's your healthcare. We're going to provide you with a healthcare for your family. You start providing bigger benefits. You don't have to pay as much as just trying to compete. And at the end of the day, cybersecurity, unless you're a consultancy or a vendor is a cost center. And we have to be more critical in terms of what we're paying. And that's where our clients tend to come to us and go, am I paying appropriately to get the right level of talent that I want? And that's where you can push back on your job descriptions and your talent searches and talent pools. And often people don't like that, especially candidates, because I can take jobs out of New York and put them in Dallas a lot cheaper. Yeah. But also the talent could be better there. And that's mm -hmm. where companies have to be awake to that is like, okay, I can go to Kentucky and pay 50 $50,000 less maybe than, than San Francisco or New York. Right. But is that actually realistic? Is the talent there? And then you just got to start looking at, okay, how long am I going to be able to keep this talent? How long, what have I got to invest in this talent to keep them there? What about relocation fees? Does it actually make sense for me to put that position there? And that's where, that's where it becomes a whole data play from a talent strategy perspective in terms of, is that, is that worth putting there? So it's a little bit more than just when we say salary bands for a candidate, this is great, but for a client, there's a lot more external and internal factors that they have to consider as to whether they're going to base this position here or whether they're going to pay that salary banding. Um, and that sort of brings me on to the last point, CISOs. CISOs are great for this because it does depend on the size company, does depend yep. on whether you're regulated, and it does depend on the risk factors that we tend to see for that organization, i.e., are they, you know, what is their reporting line? Are they having to report to the board because the risks are, because they value security so highly because the risks are so high? That's going to push your salary banding up a lot more towards the C-suite level. If you're two or three down, which still blows my mind, but still happens, and I'm sure a lot of CISOs listening to this, it hurts them because I, I'm having to now be a, a career coach for CISOs to try and help them improve their reporting line, there which I never imagined doing, by the way. No, no. Um, but there's some CISOs that are that I that I speak to are at 150, 180. Mm -hmm. I'm like you are overseeing a security program. Firstly, how are you hiring people that are below your salary? <laughs> Secondly, how can, how can you convince me as a candidate that they're taking security seriously when you're not being paid well enough? You're right. not being valued at your job. Hmm. And that's the key thing. Yeah. And what I'm now trying to convince CISOs is to try and be, okay, you've exhausted all options. You've led with data. You've gone to that board and said, I'm going to leave or I, I want to do this. And this is where the market values me. Whatever you need to do to get that conversation going. And we provide a lot of suggestions on that. Kind of one or two more questions for you in here anyway. But, um, you know, yeah. a, a, apart from, you know, they say we, we, I'm sure we do have CISOs listening, but we, what we get a lot of is people who are just not only at the, the bottom rung of the, you know, the security ladder, but who are just thinking about even just entering the industry. So for as someone who helps cybersecurity professionals at all levels, do you have any tips for newcomers who might feel a little intimidated about where, or how to start their job searches or what of their skills to sort of emphasize and, and their resume? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, it's obviously a focus point with the, with the, the myth of the skills gap. You know, we, our key message is, is that we don't really believe there's a skills gap. We, we just right. believe that, that people need to change their behaviors and beliefs in terms of what that looks like and, and how that works. And we've touched on job descriptions. We touched on salaries. They're key things that create the skills gap. Um, but, the, but the second thing is, is the amount of young people we're now producing for cybersecurity. And our fear and the, the fear that we're, uh, fear is the wrong word, 
Um, but our, our sort of exposure to the market mm -hmm. is allows us to see into the job you know, uh, the, the job economy as such. And what we, you know, and I, I'm very fortunate to deal with some of the, the best universities in, in the United States and actually, you know, talk to them about this. And I'm trying to teach some of the professors, like saying, like, we are creating fascinating, exciting degrees that are very cyber, you know, specific. We're, we're developing architect, security architecture and engineering specific degrees. We are teaching more assurance degrees now, more instant response and digital forensic degrees. You know, there's, yep. there's, there's a couple of brilliant digital forensic degrees that we are able to recruit for our consultancies directly from them universities. However, the, when we talk about the, the pyramid with the, with the CISO at the top, Right. What, we, what we've currently seen is there's a pyramid at the bottom. So it's become a diamond. Hmm. Interesting. Entry-level jobs are very, very small right now. Yeah. And we've turned, we've turned this industry into a lot of mid-level people hmm. that, can't, that are finding it hard to get up. And we've found, we found that there's a lot of entry-level people that just can't enter the, into the diamond. Right. And a lot of people feel that, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and we can't hide that. That exists. That exists. And, and what we're trying to communicate is that the market we now need to start considering isn't an entry level market for people that are coming into the industry because of trust. You know, do you trust a graduate to come in and take on an, you know, an exposure of risk? Right. Do we want, do we actually want that? Like we all seem to put on job descriptions. Um, obviously I don't design the job descriptions, but what, what we see is, yeah. you know, minimum two years experience. So do we just not want that? And the third thing is, are we, are we able to get them internships or any type of experience to, you know, get them to get them on the road and get them some real life experience? Because we always hear that famous term, well, what real life experience do you have? Yes. Well, if you don't give the people the opportunity, you can't, they can't get the real life experience. We all know that we've all, we've all had that for the last 20 to 30 years. It was exactly the same when I came out of university as it would be to anyone else's generation that came out of university. So, you know, and that comes back to our, you know, why don't we just abolish degrees as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, yeah. as a need because, you know, then people that don't have the degrees have normally got the real life experience. And that's where we're, we're that sort of, half a dozen of one, you know, half a dozen of another, you know, it's that catch 22 scenario. So what we need to make candidates aware is that we need them to go and get it experience or risk experience. Look at different areas where you, where you can touch cyber. You might go into an incident management, uh, you know, role or a it help desk role or a it support role or a risk analyst, something that they don't see as a, a, a or sorry sorry something they see as an avenue into cybersecurity, and there's some of the areas and that can get you your real life one year two year experience and they will allow you to work on tools like burp suite or ftk right. and forensics or, or whatever it is there you go. um and, and that's that's the way of learning um and that's the way of getting that experience in terms of internships there's some great ones out there unfortunately you know companies still don't value this as real life experience okay and, and that's that's the thing that we get i go well they've just been at aon and completed a six uh, a three-month internship yeah you know or been at walmart or been at facebook or google and some of these large organizations that provide excellent internships and i've witnessed a lot of them i've been inside them to be able to tell my clients this is what's going on but many of them don't value that because of a company policy, a bit like the degree that value that as real life experience. Now I still say go and get that experience because the network that you get from them experiences is by far more valuable than what you actually might learn on them, uh, on them experiences. But be open. If you're entering this market, be open to cyber jobs, be open to it jobs, be open to risk jobs. And certainly don't take the first no, because you're going to yeah. get a lot of no's in your career yeah. that if you stop now, you're never going to be successful in, in cybersecurity. Okay. So as we wrap up today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Beecher Madden. And, and so I, I want to get a sense of what, what types of services do you provide for your clients and, and what sort of people who might be listening to this might want to use you, you know, and so forth. Yeah, we, we have, you know, we have the, the, the traditional recruitment services, 
Um, okay. So we, we do permanent and contracting uh, within the, within the cybersecurity and risk sector um, for, for a number of organizations. You know, we have, uh, we have well over a hundred clients that just in the U S alone that we're very fortunate to work for. And so from a, from a candidate perspective, you know, the, the, you know, to provide a better education, the organization is the one that pays us. They, they contract us to, you know, to, um, to find these people for them. Uh, yep. So the candidates are always willing to, to approach us, you know, and, and see what opportunities we have. And on the client side, you know, we, we provide that model um, as well as executive search for, for CISO, CIOs uh, and similar positions. Uh, and then uh, away from that, for the client perspective, as I was going to say, is around data analytics. So we provide a lot of talent pools. We can tell you where best to provide, where best to put that skill set. We do skills audits for our clients. We do a lot of uh, consultancy where we would go on site for a number of days for our clients to actually work out like, okay, what do they need? How yep. better can we improve their processes? How better can we actually uh, make them more attractive for candidates to hopefully decrease that fill time and actually decrease their risk because people are risk and recruitment is a risk to the business. So we help them better understand that and better help CISOs educate HR and talent acquisition on that as well. Because obviously there's a lot of generalists that don't understand what they're looking for or how to best to speak to the market as well. And the last bit is salary benchmarking. You know, that's where we're probably really utilized in the marketplace right now is, is we do a lot of salary benchmarking for our clients and we do that globally, um, which allows company, which allows CISOs to go to their board and say, this is how much it's going to cost. I think I can get this person for, the, for this. Um, can, can I get sign off to go and do that? And, and we can do that a lot quicker. Um, you know, evidence-based is exactly how CISOs and, and heads of security are going to win in this market um, and, and keep a, you know, ahead of their competition, but also keep their board happy, which is ultimately the, the CISO should be their CISO's goal is to, is to keep the C-suite and board happy because that keeps, that makes them have an easier and, and stress-free in some, in some somewhat life, I suppose, in, yeah. in some somewhat way. I, I don't know how when uh, when so many CISOs are telling me to they're burning out but um yeah i think keeping yeah, yeah. them off their back is uh, is is hopefully will make their job easier uh so if our listeners want to know more about carl Sharman or beecher madden uh where can they go online yeah of course yeah well, we uh we have beechermadden.com uh and then it's you can find me C H E R madden m-a-d-d-e-n yeah yep. dot com okay and uh, not short at all um yep. so but yeah ultimately find me on my linkedin reach out i'm always okay. willing to have conversations with people Great. um most people find my number most people find my email very easily as well uh that's the problem with uh with, with media these days especially when i leave <laughs> it on my linkedin half the time as well yeah. um but um but yeah obviously like i'm i'm absolutely happy to have conversations with anyone and see how i can benefit their career or benefit the the issues they're having in their organization from a staffing perspective um and yeah happy to keep educating and keep uh, learning myself as well that's awesome carl thank you so much for your time and insights today i really appreciate your time no i appreciate yours and it was a uh, great being a part of this Good. Well, we're happy to have you. And uh, we'd like to thank you all, as usual, for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in Cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search Cyberwork with InfoSec in your podcast catcher of choice. And if you wouldn't mind, leave us a five-star rating and review. Uh, it really does help people to find us. Uh, for a free month of the InfoSec Skills platform discussed in today's show, just go to infosec.com slash skills, sign up for an account, and in the coupon line, type cyberwork, all one word, all small letters, no spaces, uh, to get your free month. Uh, you can also use our free election security training resource to educate poll workers and volunteers on the cybersecurity threats they might face during the election season. For more information about how to download your training packet, visit infosecinstitute.com slash IQ slash election dash security dash training, or click the link in the description. Thank you once again to Carl Sharman and Beecher Madden, and thank you all for watching and listening. We will speak to you next week.